got a full house here. Um, so I'm here today to talk about some of the techniques that we use to, to answer this question. Do migrating, particularly songbirds, respond to al altitudinal variation in winds during long over water flights? And there's a number of co-authors on this presentation I'd like to acknowledge, two of which are here, so Gilbor and Mike Ward. Um, so an optical, optimal migration theory predicts that ver um, migratory behaviors should evolve to decrease certain things, especially time, energetic condition, and or predation risk, or any interaction of those, in order to increase survival probability and reproductive success. So we know that um, animals, especially birds in this case, um, vary their, be their roots, for example, from year to year, um, and also vary how long they take between fueling. And a lot of times this variation is probably directly linked to both geography and to other extrinsic factors, such as weather winds. So winds are very important in our system. So we work in the Gulf of Mexico, which is um, the large gulf here in North America. Uh, we catch birds here in Fort Morgan, Alabama. And at this point, uh, many of the birds winter down in Central and South America that pass through this point. And so they have the choice at that point to go around the gulf or to go across the gulf. And many birds do choose to go across the gulf at this point. And if they do, the shortest distance is between 950 and 1025 kilometers to the Yucatan Peninsula, our other site. And so in order to make this, this is a longer than average flight for a lot of these birds. A lot of these birds will only fly during night, and this will take longer than 13 hours to fly. So in order to do this, a lot of them will wait until good tail tailwinds um, to reduce their energetic cost of crossing. So in the Gulf of Mexico itself, though, it's in the trade wind zone. So the prevailing winds are actually from the east for most days, um, which is not favorable if you're going from our site here down to the Yucatan. But a lot of um, systems move through. This is the peak of tropical weather season, for example. So a lot, if a tropical storm is moving through, such as Hurricane Isaac, just kind of rolling through, you see that the winds do change from day to day. And then on some nights, you do get very favorable winds for this crossing. Um, the winds do vary from according to altitude, however. So you don't have to just think about um, latitude and longitudinal changes in wind favorability. You also have to think about it from the altitudinal strategy. So and this is three wind roses, which a wind rose is just a circular histogram of wind directions. In this case, and this is showing winds too, showing that there's variation in altitude. So in the first case, in each case, I'm showing the same number of altitudes. It's just that there's more in one direction, you see less variability. So this is going from 200 meters up to four kilometers. So this first night that I'm showing here, there's very little variation. You see the same wind direction, whether you're on the ground or if you're 4,000 meters up. Whereas in the middle, you see more. And then here on this last night, you see lots of variation, lots of wind shear. And so if a bird chose to go um, at one altitude in one night, it might not have favorable winds at that same altitude in a different night. So um, we do see that birds do respond to these variation in altitudes and that you'll see with the radar, especially that birds, the peak of migration will go up and down depending on where these favorable winds are. Um, so in our system, we, have, we actually have radio tagged six species, but we're going to focus on swains and thrushes for this talk. That's the one that we tagged the most of, and also we know a lot about their behavior, so it makes them a little bit easier to model, at least initially, for this system. So swains and thrushes um, breed up in northern North America in winter down in Central America, um, and they also are known to mostly maintain their heading and their airspeed during a single night's flight. So we saw this morning at the keynote that they do change from night to night. They're heading slightly mostly during a flight they maintain it. So that's important to know for our models. Because so other birds may um, compensate for drift more or less than these birds typically do. So we have um, several hypotheses about how they might minimize energy during fright, flight um, by selecting different altitudes. One is that since this species doesn't adjust headings or air speeds, it was actually observed that they might be changing altitudes in order to find these winds that support their um, preferred direction of movement. And um, this was seen in Illinois over land. And also that they might avoid turbulence because turbulent areas can, um, uh, turbulent altitudes can be more energetically costly. And they've seen that with um, heartbeat uh, studies that they do actually when they're in more turbulent layers, their heart rates go up. So we can um, hypothesize that they do either of these or they do both of these at the same time. They're looking at both kinds of information and choosing altitudes based on that. 
So the data that we collected to build the models um, that we use are based on these radio telemetry towers. So these birds are very small. We can't put the little satellite trackers. Um, but we can put radio um, tags on them. And then uh, we have towers on the Alabama side. So here's Fort Morgan. We have uh, currently five towers there. And so these towers have six Yagis going in all directions so that when the birds leave, we can get um, directions so we're not out there hand tracking them all. And then on the Yucatan side, we have seven. And these have slightly different orientation to maximize um, detection across the whole top of the Yucatan Peninsula. So if birds come in from any direction and come over the Yucatan, we're going to pick them up, basically. Um, the telemetry data that we have basically gives us, instead of millions of points like the last speaker, we get several very distinct um, bits of information on either side. So on the departure side in Alabama, we get the date and time that they left, left and the de departure track bearing. And on the arrival, we get the date and time and the location, the bearing not quite so much because of the orientation of the, um, of the, of the antenna. But we also get the flight duration or the difference between arrival and um, detection time or departure. So the weather data we use is NAR. And so NAR has a um, resolution of 32 kilometers and 250 meters vertical resolution and a temporal resolution of three hours. Um, I do interpolate all these to exact location using an inverse, um, inverse distance formula, which is the same that MoveBank uses in the M, da M data set. So we actually do get our data through M data. Um, but most people put in a track and get those annotated since we only have two locations, but we need the weather in between. We use this alternate website, which is available, where we can put in a CSV of the, times, of the locations that we want and then use those to build the model to create the tracks later. So I put in a CSV with the same resolution, 32 kilometers and three hours. And then MoveBank actually will interpolate the altitudes to me to 100 meters. So they do the interpolate, which that takes a little bit of meteorological knowledge that I don't have, so that helps out a lot. So these models, um, basically each bird that we, um, that took a direct flight across the Yucatan, were able to model the behavior between the departure and the arrival location um, based on this algorithm of different behavioral um, steps. So first, I would like to go over a few key uh, concepts. So these are different um, speed terms and then different direction terms, so they're going together. So airspeed is the direction that the bird's head is pointed, or body is oriented, and then the associated heading is that direction. I'm sorry, that's the speed that they're going, and we're re not relative to the ground, and this is the direction that they're pointing. And then wind speed, obviously, is the speed of the wind and the direction that it's going to. And then ground speed is a resultant vector of these two, with the bearing being that. So I use these terms throughout. And so what the model, in the model, what I do first is I pick the initial altitude, airspeed, and departure bearing, and those are different parameters that I systematically um, change throughout the model. And then next step, the bird will retrieve, or the model retrieves the winds, and then I calculate the heading from that. And so the heading, because we know the, I input the departure direction, we know the wind direction, so we calculate the heading, and that heading remains constant for the whole simulation. And then they're allowed to fly along the, Loxodrum or run line for one hour and then updated their location. And then next they'll search the altitudes for different wind conditions and then pick a new altitude based on different criteria, which I'll go over next. There's different models with different criteria. And then next they'll um, look at the winds at that new place and that new time, update their bearing, update their location, and basically loop this for the exact amount of time that the bird actually flew over the gulf. And then once they arrive, or once that amount of time happens, we see where they end up and how close it is to where they actually end up. And if it's within 50 kilometers, then it's considered a match track. So the parameters that, we, that I used were um, initial altitude varying from 200 to 2,000 meters. And then at subsequent altitudes, they're allowed to go up to 4,000 meters. Um, and that was varied at 100 meters. Airspeed was typical for swains and thrushes, and that's between 9 and 18. Um, meters per second at one meter intervals. And then the departure direction, we took the actual departure bearing and then um, varied it by a plus or minus 40 degrees at two degree intervals. So the first, I said that they searched the winds based on different criteria. So we actually have six different strategies for searching the wind. And the first is they don't at all. So we run models where the birds are not searching the winds. 
They just pick an initial depart um, departure altitude, and the second one I systematically give them another altitude, and then they maintain that altitude for the whole track, um, for the flight duration. And so this is showing an example of one bird's match tracks, just to show you what that kind of looks like. So th this particular bird never picked low altitudes for its first um, time step, but then after that, it there were many different altitudes under 2,000 that would work, that would match at the end. And so the next group was there's two different strategies, one that I call random, the other one that I call turbulence only. And so in the, both of these have an additional parameter, which is search window. So obviously with no response, they're not searching different um, wind speeds, they're just staying with one. But in the, the random and turbulence only models, the search window can vary from 200, 500, or 4,000 to the full range. And this is both how far the birds can move and also how far the, the, how much information basically they have about the winds. So if a bird is at 500 meters, flying at 500 meters and has a search window of 200, it could search any of these altitudes and pick the best out of those. If it was 500, it would be a bigger range. And so that basically is how much information the birds can have. Oh, sorry. And so in, in the case of random, this is how far they can move, but they're not actually using any of the information. They're just randomly choosing another um, altitude. So this is what the tracks would look like if they're moving, but they're not using any information to make those choices. In the turbulence-only models, they're um, using information about turbulence. So they're only picking altitudes based on whether or not they have the lowest turbulence of these in the search window, not based on wind direction or speed. And then in the last three strategies, so there's six in all, um, there's an additional parameter called favorable winds, in which case um, the birds pick um, whether winds are favorable based on three criteria. So we don't really know their intended direction, um, but we have three reasonable ones that are parameters. So one is that their heading itself is the direction of movement that they tend to go in. It could be an endogenous direction. They actually do fit pretty well with what a bird would do in an inland funnel. Or we could say that the bearing is an intended direction if they're compensating for wind. So their head might be pointed one way, but they fully intend to go this way, and that's why they're going that way. Or thirdly, if they're, say, experienced with the system, they may actually be heading for the Yucatan Peninsula. So that's a third possible. In some birds, these are highly correlated, and they're not that different. But in some birds, they are quite different. And so what we do is, in each of these models, favorable winds are selected based on their wind profit. In, with the um, intended direction being one of these three. So how quickly they're going in that direction um, is it, at each altitude is how it's, the altitudes are selected. So the altitude with the best wind profit is the one that they would pick within that search window, depending on the strategy. So the three strategies, the first one is that they pick once. So in the first time set, they pick the best, and then they stick with it. So it's similar to the no response, except they actually are using information to pick the altitude. They're not just being sent anywhere. And then the second one is the winds only. So they're using wind direction and speed um, as the wind prof, um, as the selection. But in this one, in the winds and turbulence, they use the wind direction and speed, but they also choose the one that has the best turbulence. So they find the layer with best turbulence and then pick the best winds within that. So they're um, using all the information, basically. So if you were a bird that um, knew where the Yucatan was, had full um, knowledge of the airspace, and used winds and turbulence, you'd be using a lot of information. I'd be really surprised um, in order to get to the Yucatan. So sample sizes, we tagged 136 swings and thrushes. Um, of those, we were able to get departure bearings from 121. And so of those, 65 of those headed out over water. So here are the departure bearings of all the birds that we were um, that we were able to get. And so about half of them went over water. And of those, 36 were detected again in the Yucatan, so pretty good um, return rate. And then of those, 23 of them made direct flights. So a few of those took a week to get to the Yucatan, so we don't know exactly how they got there, but <laughs> they did um, get there eventually. And so of these 23, I'm still running models. They're running right now in Montana as we speak, so I do have preliminary results today. And I do invite you, I am giving a talk in September at AOU, so hopefully I'll have a lot more um, then. But um, I will show you some preliminary results today. So the 23 direct flight birds are the ones that I'm modeling. I have eight that I'm talking about today, but eventually all 23 of those will be used to build this model. So if we look at um, 
first look at the left here. These are the departure bearings of those 23 birds. And we see most of them are going out over the water in a, towards the southeast or towards the direct south. Um, if we look at winds at different, um, at different um, altitudes during their departure time, we'll see that there's a lot of spread. So these are the winds, surface winds, on the nights that these birds left. And you see they go in all directions. So if all birds were choosing based on surface winds, some of them would be picking nights that have very strong surface winds going in very weird directions. And the strength is, is the darker, thicker lines, too. So strength are included in these wind rotors. We look at 1500, same thing. There are some good winds, but sometimes there's strong winds going in the wrong direction. And the same with 3000. So a bird couldn't have a consistent, I'm just going to go at 1500 meters. I'm just going to make my decision based on 1500 meters. Um, there is a lot of variation in the winds, even in the nights that they're picking at different altitudes. So if we go back to the three that I showed you originally, this is actually three nights that four birds chose to leave. And if we look at the directions that they went, so one bird um, went left at 229 degrees, which just happens to be the exact same um, way the surface winds were going. And then the other one went at 192, which was similar to what we see at the 800 to 2,000 meter range. And these winds were going fairly strong that night. And then this middle bird went left at 199 degrees, which is similar to the winds that we see at 1,200 to 1,500. And then at this night, the 206 birds, it's similar to winds at 800. So we do see variation in where they might be if they're going similar altitudes as their directions. Um, of these four birds, only the middle bird at, was actually redetected in the Yucatan. So. so here's some preliminary results. This is my pretty pictures. Um, but this is just showing three birds that show a lot of the variation that I'm seeing in tracks. So these, this is the pick one strategy. So these birds only picked winds one time first and then stuck with that altitude. So you can see we have some that are really Curvy, so this one's being, it only picked altitude once, but it's getting pushed by the winds more than once laterally. And then we see lots of variation. So I should say these are three different individuals in different colors. All their matched tracks. And so we see lots of different variation in the number of matches per individual and also in how much spatial variation is. So this one has a wide range of possible tracks. This one's fairly narrow, and this one is very few, and they're fairly narrow. So there's a lot of variation among individuals but not so much within individuals. So if we look at the altitude, um, the altitude strategies of these matches, so these are the same three birds, but a different strategy. So these are birds that pick winds at every single time step, not just initially. We see very different patterns among individuals, too. So the top one, these are fairly low, but it has an initial climb and then a gradual descent, which actually fits pretty well with what we'd expect. From these birds. Um, the middle one has, seems to have two different possible strategies, if, if this were true, one that's kind of mid-altitude and the one that's fairly low. And then the bottom one actually has a, seems to have a high, middle, and low strategies that work. But already from these models, if these behaviors are what they're doing, we, have, we can see areas that those behaviors would not work. We're already able to reduce the solution space in what um, might and might not work if they were doing these things. If we look at all the models, the matches, this is for the eight birds. Um, don't squint too much at this. This is showing that crazy matrix before. And so the proportion of matches, I don't think it says it, it got cut off. But the proportion of matches per each of these model types. And you'll see, first off, that they're pretty low. So they're all between half percent and one percent. So most models that I try don't match, um, which actually is good. The, the less matches actually means the more we know about what they're doing, because it has a much smaller solution space. Um, but they vary very little among. So whether they have no response or they're able to use winds and turbulence is the same amount of matches, which is kind of interesting. There are some birds, though, that um, have strategies that don't have any matches. And so in that case, we can say that bird did not do this for sure. And so you can see the numbers at top indicate that. So in this case, four of the eight birds did not match these particular strategy types, so almost half are not using winds and turbulence at 4,000 meters, so those maximum information um, strategies. If we look to most of these Xs are on the purple, which purple, you can't read this, I know, but the purple is the 4,000 meter strategies, which again, we didn't find very biologically likely, but as a good way to look to see where the best winds are if they did have maximum information. And so of the matches, I still have some work to do. <laughs> So at the top, these are matches, but obviously this is a crazy. I should have mentioned, too, these are already maximized by 50, so you can see them. So they don't go higher than four kilometers, which would stay right about here on the scale. 
So they already look crazy, but this one would be like a roller coaster <laughs> bird. It would go up and down and up. So I haven't, unless it has a search window like down below, which just looks pretty, this is a search window of 200 compared to 4,000 for the same bird and the same models. And so unless we have a search window that restricts its um, height, you can have this occasionally that happens. But we can say this probably doesn't actually happen. So I have some work to do on uh, re um, reducing the model space some more based on biology. So one thing we could do is maybe uh, look at, um, like, not don't just restrict their search window in a kind of artificial way, like 200 meters, but perhaps look at the interaction between uplift and cl natural climb weights onto particular nights and use that to restrict these tracks instead. So next step, re reduce the solution spaces. And then I need, I'm going to test the optimal hypotheses by mess, um, comparing these matches to near matches and see what the difference are in those parameters. Already it seems to be that the matches have lower air speeds than the non-matches. So those choices seem to be um, good energetically and that they can go a little slower if they make those choices. And then also I have lots of ideas for incorporating new behaviors and species. So we have five other species. Um, I'd like to incorporate some more um, sophisticated behavioral rules. And also um, I'd like to uh, look at, obviously we're just doing nights that they did leave. I'd like to compare nights that they didn't leave and see what the behaviors would look like on those nights. Because I think they are definitely making um, decisions about more consistent nights that they're leaving compared to the nights that they're not. Um, so then we have this is a team of people that are working on this. So I'd like to thank them and take any questions. <laughs> if there's time. Yeah. How often do you find uh, naval strategies that would get the bird to leave the ground actually earlier? Is it often an option for them? Yes, there are. There's quite a few. And I can't tell you offhand the exact. But there's a lot. If they do just slightly faster air speeds but had similar decisions, a lot of them do spend, send up quite. So it doesn't seem like they're quite always making optimal decisions because they could get there much faster if they had picked different altitudes. Um, so part of that might be um, having to do with the search window that they're actually able to use versus what I'm allowing them to use. Um, but yeah, if they go faster, they could get there a lot faster. But again, you might ask if they go faster, that might not be the best <laughs> choice for them, too, because they would have to change their airspeed more than the winds are not changing. So, yeah. yep. Well, on a bird going, there's a line, captain's face, the comment, you're going to be very cheap on the bird, and you're an audio bird. Yes. <laughs>